Okay, I don't know how many of you guys listen to Darkness Radio with Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, but I'm a pretty big fan. I've listened to them regularly for about eight years. One of the things I used to do, I guess I still kind of do it, was when I would listen, I would often make a note whenever they shared an interesting story or if somebody called in with a story. If they sounded credible, I would typically try to take down the date and location of the event. If it was a Bigfoot sighting or a UFO sighting or whatever, I, I wanted to try to keep track of when and where it happened. Sometimes I would try to find the transcription, or I would sometimes just transcribe it myself. I'm pretty fast at typing, so... And then when I had these stories, I would just listen to these podcasts all the time. So I was constantly, you know, hearing different stories and then collecting them. I started to share the these uh, stories with a circle of researchers that I talked to. Um, so, and like any time, say for example, say there was a Black Eyed Kid story that somebody shared on some show. Uh, David Weatherly wanted me to send it to him so he could put it into his database. Lon Strickler, he's, I don't know if you know this, but he's obsessed with, like, winged creature stories. So he's, anytime I, I came across such a story or if I heard a, somebody on uh, some radio show or something talking about it, I, I you know, I had to uh, let him know about it because he wanted to uh, go, you know, he wanted to see if he could try to find the people and uh, track them down and, and call them. So that was sort of like this arrangement we had. Um, and uh, so that's sort of like some inside baseball that I'm pretty sure a few of you didn't know. I kind of like really kind of try to keep track of of what's going on. I, I listen to pretty much everything. Um, I remember that there was this episode of Darkness Radio in which a person had written in regarding a, a bizarre experience she had had with her boyfriend after they moved into an uh, apartment together. When I heard it initially, I assumed that it was going to be like some ghost story or something, uh, but it was really different, and it really stayed with me. It was something that up to that point I'd, I'd never heard of. Uh, I couldn't even really conceive of it. I had to like think about it. Um, the thing about it was that I never transcribed that story, and I still kick myself to this day. Uh, instead, I tried to write down what I remembered of the story when it was still kind of fresh in my mind. Uh, of course, Dave and Tim left iHeartRadio and went over to Chris Jericho's Podcast One. Uh, they've since gone out on their own again. I don't know the particulars of it, but I think that it had to do with wanting to own their podcast or something. And when they left iHeart, their entire archive of shows were basically removed and are no longer available. And I'm not sure, I don't think Tim and Dave own or have access to their old shows. But at least, at least the ones they did for uh, iHeart. So I think that's why it's not available. So anyways, I'll tell you the story. So Dave Schrader read this letter from this girl. I don't remember her name, but I keep thinking it was something like April. Uh, in it, April, I'm just going to call her April. April, they managed to find the... Uh, I guess a reasonably priced apartment and they settled in their boyfriend and it was for a time all good um, it was really great in the beginning but over time she began to sense things about her boyfriend that th there was just something wrong with him she said that he started to behave in ways that she found odd it's one of those things where you don't really notice it at first but the more the more you spend time with a person they sort of let their guard down and you start to understand their quirks and things that make them tick. She said it started out like little things. He would wake up in the middle of the night and start complaining about people that lived above them, how noisy they were being. Though April was pretty sure that the apartment above theirs was not being rented, so she thought that was kind of odd. Also, when he would start complaining, she would sit and listen and she never heard anything. He would carry on like there was this big party going on, but to her, it was just dead quiet. So she was like, okay, that's really weird. So as time went on, he began doing other things, like complaining that people were watching them. Like when they would go out, he would say, 
that they were being followed, though she wouldn't see anyone. He would tell her that there were people standing on the street at all hours of the day and night looking up at their apartment, that people would drive by looking up into their window. April claimed that whenever she would look outside, she wouldn't see anyone. She began to realize that her boyfriend had some kind of mental problem, like he was paranoid or something. It was subtle, but the more comfortable he got with her, the more she began to see that side of him. It wasn't so bad that she wanted to break up with him, but she saw it and it was concerning. Okay, so then that's when things got really strange. She recalled that one night, many months after moving in, he woke up again, began complaining about how the people upstairs were being noisy again. Uh, as she always did, she just agreed, kind of like played along. Though that's when she, you know, sat down, sat there and just listened and she began to hear it. She heard the noise. It was very low, but as she sat listening, the volume of whatever was happening upstairs increased. Unlike all the other times, this time she did hear something and it was loud enough that she could understand her boyfriend's anger. The sound was what he described, a lot of noise, voices, a rowdy party of some kind. This thing of waking up and hearing the, the noise began to happen almost on a nightly basis. They both could hear it and it was always around the same time late in the evening. They complained to the landlord but the landlord was adamant that there was nobody up there, that the place was locked up and he checked it regularly, it was completely vacant. Even stranger, April claims that she began to see what he was seeing. People standing outside their apartment, looking up into their window. She also saw the cars with people inside driving down the street, looking up at their apartment. When they would go out, April saw the cars following them too. She began to sense that she was being watched and something ominous was happening that she didn't understand. A terrible feeling of dread. What he had been seeing and hearing she also was seeing and hearing, but for months she hadn't. It was almost as if somebody had flipped a switch, allowing her to see it. How was that possible? Eventually it began to affect their relationship and they decided to break up. After he moved out, everything she had been seeing and hearing, the strange late night sounds, the odd people outside their apartment, the feeling of dread, of being followed, it all stopped as if, again, somebody had flipped a switch. Sometime later, her boyfriend was apparently diagnosed as a, I think a paranoid schizophrenic or something like that. She found out after that he had an, up to that point, untreated mental illness. He was now getting treated for it. That's sort of when it hit her, that everything they'd seen and heard was in his mind. None of it was real. This is why she couldn't hear it or see it at first, and why it stopped when he left. That said, April could not explain what she saw and heard prior to them breaking up. She was certain that she did hear the noisy people above them. She did see the people outside, and it was exactly like he described. She also knew that she didn't imagine it. The people she saw were real. The cars she saw were real. The voices of the people upstairs, the noises, were real. Though she realized that whenever she heard and saw these things, she was always with her boyfriend. She never saw or heard anything when she was alone, like almost like he had to be present for these things to happen, for these things to manifest. I have to admit, I had never heard of that. I've heard of tulpas where people conjure up entities by sheer force of thought and will, but I've never heard of somebody manifesting a paranoid state to another person. It was as if her mind was somehow connected to his and she was observing the same things that he was seeing and hearing. It was as if he, by sheer thought, had conjured into reality his paranoia. The noises and the strange people he saw were made real by him, and she was able to experience it in the same way he was. When he was not around, the experience ended. Like I said at the time, I'd never heard of a case like it, and I'm sure there's skeptics out there who will attribute it to mass hallucination. People like Robert Bartholomew make a lot of money pushing that everything's a mass hallucination nonsense, but I don't think that's what was happening here. Since then, I have come across more cases like April's. In his book, Real Vampires, 
Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side, Brad Steiger dedicated a chapter to a letter he had received from a man named Ryan Harris. The events he described were chilling and brought to mind April's experiences. Ryan Harris met Elena Sanchez in 1981. They were both in college. Ryan thought her beautiful, and there was something about her personality that he found very attractive. Elena was deeply interested in the occult. She was into Hatha Yoga, meditated often, and studied texts on ceremonial magic. She would indulge in long walks in the forest, where she felt a connection with the animals and the plant life. Ryan also discovered she was into other things not so sweet. He would sometimes find Elena engaged in strange rituals that made him feel uneasy. He was able to overlook this as she was quite a talented artist with an amazing mind for music. She was also quite jovial and he enjoyed her company to the point where he decided to pop the question. Just prior to their graduation, he decided to ask her to marry him. Ryan never forgot her reply. I will marry you, she told him, but not because I love you. Don't get me wrong, though because I am very fond of you. I'll marry you because I know I must. It is my karma and yours. She added with tears in her eyes, I'm afraid it won't work out very well. Not at all. Still, if it is to be, it will be. And there's nothing we can do about it. It has been ordained by powers greater than we. Ryan found her response to be quite bizarre. And Elena seemed to sense this and jokingly told him to forget it. She was goofing around. Ryan eventually forgot about Elena's odd prophecy. They were married in June 1986. They had both grown up in the Pacific Northwest and decided to move to Portland in the year following their marriage. Ryan found work as an accountant for a large printing company. The two experienced no marital problems other than the usual adjusting to each other until Elena became pregnant with their first child in late spring 1987. It was then that something began to go very wrong causing Ryan to remember her unhappy prediction that their marriage would, quote, not work out very well, not at all. It started when Elena began having a series of terrifying nightmares, all with the same disturbing theme. She insisted that a demon was trying to possess her body. Elena explained to Ryan that the demon appeared to her in two forms. One was a frightening creature with a human face, the talons and legs of an eagle, the body and tail of a cat, and the leathery wings of a bat. The other form was, in one sense, far more insidious. It was of a man who bore a strong resemblance to Ryan. Around this time, Ryan noticed a change in her personality. Elena became angry and ill-tempered, seemingly resentful of him. Elena told him that she sensed the demon was responsible for the dark thoughts she found herself entertaining. She was convinced that the entity was trying to persuade her that Ryan was the source of her problems, and after a time, it appeared as though the entity had succeeded in convincing her of it. She became hostile any time Ryan got close to her, and he began to believe that she was delusional. He did not want to believe that his wife might be losing her mind, but after a series of violent incidents involving shattered glass, bed sheets found cut to pieces, and other things, he had no choice but to conclude as much. When Ryan would ask her about the damaged items he would find, Elena began to get defensive about her actions. She lied and tried to hide any evidence of her destructive moods. Things came to a head one day when Ryan came upon Elena while she was in the act of strangling a neighborhood cat with an electric cord. When he rushed in to save the animal, Elena looked at him. Her face was flushed and she had a malevolent gleam in her eye. In a word, she looked evil. She eventually released the cat. The animal survived, but the damage was done, and Ryan decided that it was time to get help. Their family doctor, who was not qualified as a psychiatrist, brushed it off as nothing. Elena suffered with a physical ailment, and he thought it might be affecting her mood somewhat. Ryan knew there was something wrong with her, but decided to stay with her anyway. Her nightmares continued, and she became quite wild in her bedtime thrashings. He feared that she might miscarry. Thankfully, she didn't was able to deliver a child, a boy, into the world in February 1988. The child, named Robert Daniel Harris, was healthy, and Ryan hoped that with the delivery, Elena's dark moods would subside. They didn't. Elena's erratic behavior only increased, as did her nightmares. It happened almost nightly, 
and it began to affect his work. He feared losing his job. Two years would pass. They had another child, a girl this time, Emily. On the afternoon of January 22, 1990, within a year, Elena's behavior so frightened him that he began to contemplate taking the children to live with his mother until Elena got better. Things only went downhill from there. Elena developed two personalities, herself and another she called Elisa. Elena was the affectionate, kind, quirky woman he married, while Elisa was violent, angry, and cruel. Elisa began picking fights with the neighbors and harassed anyone who stopped by their home. Anytime they would go out to shop, Elisa would start fights with strangers, and Ryan soon became embarrassed to be around her. A sympathetic co-worker somehow persuaded Ryan to consider having his wife committed to an institution for the insane, although he was reluctant to do it. Close friends and family managed to convince him that it might be the best thing for Elena, as well as for the safety of their children. Ryan thought a brief period of professional treatment might actually help her. At the sanity hearing in May 1992, Elena completely submerged and Elisa came out, showing her best side. She argued brilliantly in her own defense and succeeded in convincing the judge that Ryan had manufactured the entire story to be rid of her. She managed to discredit the testimony of several of the witnesses. She even suggested that her neighbor's testimony was false because the woman had been having an affair with Ryan. Eventually the case was dismissed. Ryan was forced to accept the court's ruling. He sensed that something tragic was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. He brought Robert and Emily to his parents' home north of Portland for temporary care. They understood the situation and agreed to help. Now with the children no longer in the house, Elena's mental state seemed to deteriorate even further. She became a raging, dangerous maniac, and Ryan felt as though he was living in a nightmare. The neighbors became so antagonistic that Ryan decided to quit his job and move out of Portland. Elena went to stay at her mother's. Mrs. Sanchez had younger children of her own and could not care adequately for her mentally unwell older daughter. She asked Ryan if the two of them could stay at the small acreage that the Sanchez family owned, a cottage outside of town. Ryan agreed. It was a small place with not many people around. Ryan felt it adequate to live in for a period of time. He hoped that, in this new environment, Elena's mental health would improve. Sadly, it did not. Once there, Ryan planted a small garden and tried to be as self-sufficient as possible. Elena's condition worsened, but somehow the situation seemed more tolerable, with no other people around. Elena insisted that the demon from her nightmares had followed them, and she reported frequently that it had appeared to her while staying at the cottage. Ryan did not believe in the possibility of demons in possession. He understood that she was mentally unwell, and so any claims of demons appearing, he attributed to that. Further, Ryan had never once seen the demon or heard him. He only had her word that the creature existed. It wasn't until one night in October 1992 that his thoughts on the matter changed. It was a cool, moonlit evening. The only sound in the room was the gentle rustle of cloth as light breeze blew in through the window. Ryan was laying in bed, Elena beside him. He rolled over on his side, suddenly aware of a noise that had awakened him. It was then he heard a voice. Out thou, foul demon! Why dost thou torment me? Go and leave me in peace. It was Elena. She was sitting upright in bed, her eyes staring into the darkness at the foot of the bed. She was talking to something that he could not see. Feeling that she was having yet another nightmare, he reached out and began to shake her awake, telling her that nothing was there. He looked back down at the foot of the bed. His eyes were starting to become accustomed to the darkness, and that's when he saw it. There was something standing there. He admits that the sight of this figure standing there shocked him, there was a tiny bit of moonlight streaming into the room through the window, and as Ryan stared, he began to make out that this wasn't just some creeper that had broken into their home, it was something else. Ryan remembered whispering, oh my god, over and over, because standing there was a hideous creature. Ryan described that it had a thin, serpent-like mouth with white fangs, it was gray with reddish-colored hair flowing around the perimeter of its skull. 
Its eyes were like bright red orbs. Ryan remembered saying, What in the hell are you? It did not respond. Elena also didn't say anything. To Ryan, she appeared to be in an almost hypnotized state, unable to break eye contact with the entity. Ryan's wife began to ramble off more biblical phrases, which only made the situation that more unnerving. Unsure of what to do and absolutely terrified, Ryan did the only thing he could think of. He jumped out of bed and flipped on the light switch. And when he did this, the entity vanished and his wife suddenly came out of her weird state. After witnessing the entity himself, Ryan was forced to reconsider his earlier stance with regards to spiritual matters. He felt that this was something that science could not understand, and there was a feeling of hopelessness that set in. Who do you turn to with something like this? People would think he's crazy. He was also forced to confront the reality that maybe his wife was dealing with something that he, up to then, believed to be a delusion. Maybe it wasn't. The pair continued to stay in the cottage, though things came to a head one quiet night when, while sitting in the living room, Elena showed Ryan a picture she had drawn. The picture was of Ryan, though he looked like a hideous version of himself. Ryan asked why she drew it, and she told him that she had drawn the demon, and it was him. Ryan insisted that he had seen the entity and that he believed her, that it was not him. It didn't matter. Elena had somehow convinced herself that the demon had inhabited him. She claimed that while drawing the picture of Ryan, the demon had stood in the room. He stood right in the middle of the floor and stared at me the whole time, she told him. Ryan noted that as she spoke, her face began to take on a sinister expression. Don't you see, Ryan? The demon is you. That's why I have to kill you, dear. She claimed that the demon had turned and walked right into Ryan. She was convinced that the demon was inside of him and she must kill him to save him. Ryan owned a 22 caliber rifle which he kept at the cottage for protection. Elena had retrieved it and pointed it at him. She clicked off the safety. He couldn't get me so he went into you. He's got you now, but I can free you. Don't worry, she told him. Ryan realized in that moment that she was going to murder him. Suddenly, a noise on the roof diverted both of their attention. Something was walking with measured tread across the roof of the house. He managed to convince Elena that the demon was on the roof, that the sounds they were hearing was the demon. Elena reiterated that the demon had entered him, but Ryan insisted that it was playing a trick on her. That if Ryan wasn't there, then the demon would have her all to himself. Elena then pointed the rifle, which was loaded, towards the ceiling and began firing. Ryan is certain that he could hear loud flapping wings and got the sense that something large had been up on the roof. He heard it fly off. He didn't know what it was, but Elena seemed transfixed by it, and Ryan was able to push her to the ground and get the rifle. He admits that he was nearly hysterical. That was enough for him. He grabbed the gun and a blanket and went out to the car where he slept. She joined him in the car, but Ryan acknowledged that he was frightened of her, and he knew he had to leave. The next morning, he gathered their belongings and packed them into the car. He drove her to her mother's house, where he unloaded them without saying a word. He slid behind the driver's seat once more, leaving his wife standing on the porch. Her personal effects stacked around her. As he drove off, he began to cry. He looked in the rearview mirror, where he could see Elena standing on the porch, waving goodbye. Her face held a look of desolation and despair impossible to describe. Two and a half months later, Ryan received a letter from his mother-in-law. Elena had been legally declared insane and placed under a doctor's supervision at a state mental hospital. Ryan visited Elena numerous times, often taking the children to see her. He felt a deep sense of guilt for walking away, but admitted he had no idea what else to do. In his recounting to Steiger, Ryan seemed uncertain of a few things. Did his wife act that way because she was insane? Or was a demon actually trying to possess her? Was it actually the thing responsible for her behavior? Ryan had seen the entity with his own eyes, and he'd heard the flapping noise as something huge and with wings took off from the roof, so he knew it was real. He wondered if her earlier dalliances with the occult had somehow conjured forth this creature, or was it always there? He did find it strange that the mood swings and nightmares really only got started after she got pregnant with their first child. Though there was that strange prophetic comment when he asked her to marry him that made him wonder. He was certain, though, that it was a demon that had interrupted their lives. 
though he did not know where it came from, did it come from another plane of existence, or had it come from her mind? Steiger himself suggested that it was some kind of demon from hell that had manifested itself into their lives, though when I read the story I had a completely different take on it. I don't believe that what Ryan saw was actually a demon at all, but rather something hideous that his wife's insane mind had created and manifested into reality, if only briefly, with her thoughts. Like tuning into a radio station, Ryan was able to see momentarily what his wife was seeing, though the things he saw and later heard only existed because his wife made them exist. Had she not been there, I doubt he would have seen anything. I sometimes wonder if all these strange cryptids and ghosts and aliens and children with black eyes and everything else that people are seeing are actually conjured into reality from other people's minds. Brief snapshots of thoughts made real. This would explain why people keep seeing Slenderman even though Slenderman is a fictional creation, or why people see Sesame Street characters that don't exist, or even Santa Claus. These entities, be they ghost, alien, cryptid, or other, are often described as seeming odd, at a place, sometimes confused, just seconds before vanishing away. They almost never leave a trace. Witnesses also often describe how everything gets quiet just before and during the encounter as if it's happening in a vacuum. I wonder if this feeling of being in a vacuum during an encounter is a side effect of a mind projecting these entities into our world. The reason why these creatures rarely ever leave a trace of their existence is because they are only real for as long as the projector allows them to be.